So uh, the first topic we'll cover uh, that Dr. Doble will speak to is mechanisms of resistance and some of the science behind it. And then we'll follow with uh, Dr. Shaw speaking on some of the clinical options. So Bob. Well, thank you very much to Grace for inviting me. It's really a privilege to uh, speak in front of so many motivated and engaged uh, patients, um, and it's a, it's a great honor. And thanks to Carly for organizing this uh, great event as well. Uh, some disclosures there. So to start off, um, we know that uh, we've made very, very rapid uh, um, progress in this particular disease. I made this timeline to kind of help show um, how quickly uh, when, when patients and uh, academia and pharmaceutical are kind of organized around a goal, they can uh, elicit a really rapid uh, change in the way that we treat lung cancer. ALK was initially identified um, as a gene rearrangement and another disease altogether in 1994, so now over 20 years ago. Um, but it took really until 2007 when it was discovered by Dr. Mano's group in Japan um, to really get uh, um, clinical trials um, uh, going ahead. Um, it turned out there was actually already a drug that was uh, in clinical trials, this little known drug at that time, crizotinib. Um, uh, and quickly, uh, patients were accrued. And actually, around the first time that we saw some of the first results uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, uh, we actually had um, the first mechanism of resistance reported. This is a mutation. I'll talk about it a little bit in a minute. Um, uh, very shortly after that, crizotinib was FDA approved uh, for ALK positive non small cell lung cancer. And then only three short years later, we have seritinib uh, FDA approved or Zycadia approved. Um, for ALK-positive crizotinib-resistant patients. And this is really a remarkable feat, um, especially if you put this in the context of EGFR, our colleagues downstairs. Um, their first medicines were uh, approved in 2003 or 2004, um, and arguably um, a, a real true uh, next generation inhibitor has not yet been approved, although hopefully uh, shortly a decade later. So it's, it's really laudable how um, quickly this has uh, moved. Um, in thinking about um, the um, benefits of uh, crizotinib, we know that it's clearly superior to chemotherapy based on Dr. Shaw's work and others. Um, and really, I think of this in, in three different um, uh, critical endpoints. Um, one is the response rate. So shown here is this ORR, objective response rate. So we know that more patients with uh, their tumors respond at a higher rate or shrink at a higher rate um, than standard chemotherapy, whether it's given in the first line or second line. The time on drug before it uh, stops working and there's progression is far superior for crizotinib compared to chemotherapy. Um, and also, um, and then very importantly, typically with far less side effects. Um, now, one point that I do want to make that I think um, was made earlier as well, um, this doesn't mean that we should never use chemotherapy. The drugs still have activity. There are still really respectable um, uh, therapeutic responses with chemotherapy um, and, and time before disease progression. So there are some situations where chemotherapy really does make sense if you don't have access to a clinical trial or there have been other options, and I'll come back to this in a minute. So in thinking about um, how uh, ALK works and how um, uh, resistance develops, um, I thought it was important to kind of put up a, a structure of what a, a kinase is. They actually all look relatively similar from, from kind of the 30,000 foot view. But you can think of the ALK kinase, um, the thing that drives the cancer cell to grow, divide, spread, and do all the bad things that cancers do, um, as this lock uh, here. So ALK is this lock, um, this blue blob, and this is actually what it looks like by x-ray crystallography. Within um, part of this region is a small groove or valley, this yellow-green area, um, where um, uh, ATP typically binds, um, but also where we've designed our key, crizotinib, um, to spit, fit very specifically um, into this pocket. So you can think of this as the lock, this is the keyhole, and crizotinib is really the key that unlocks this um, um, with some great uh, specificity. In thinking about ways in which um, the cancer becomes resistant, one very uh, easy mechanism for a cancer cell, one that we've actually known about for a very long time, 
um, is for the cancer cell to really um, have a very simple nucleotide change, so something in the coding DNA that changes the structure of this pocket, basically changes the structure of the keyhole um, so that the key no longer fits very well, um, and this protein continues to function and can continue to do the, all of the bad things um, that it does. Fortunately, um, there are a number of uh, very talented chemists who can uh, basically retool these keys. And so I've just put a few up here of the more uh, well-known drugs, seritinib, electinib, Ariads AP26113, and PF3992. They all have slightly different structures, um, but one of the key features is that they fit a little bit more broadly into that keyhole um, and can kind of re-pick the lock, even when um, the, the cancer cell uh, has tried to change this. So one of the questions I think that's um, very challenging and on everyone's minds is how do you choose the right key? And of course, there's no very simple answer to this. Um, I think one of the first things you have to ask is do you have access or kind of the means to make it to a clinical trial? Um, if so, we of course always encourage patients to go on clinical trials, not only because we think that a lot of these drugs are very efficacious, but it's how we continue to move forward. If not, fortunately now there is an FDA approved option. So one of these drugs, at least seritinib or Zycadia, is now FDA approved. And in comparing them, we have to look at several different criteria. Um, efficacy. Does it shrink tumors, and for how long does it do so? And we're starting to have data emerge in both of these realms. How well does it treat brain metastases, which is a little bit different problem that I'll come back to. Um, and then also, uh, how tolerable is it? Now, one of the problems is, is that these are sometimes very difficult questions to answer unless the drugs are compared head to head in a trial. But we do have some emerging data to suggest that these drugs um, are quite efficacious. So do they work? And the answer is, Clearly, yes. Yeah. So this is just looking at tumor responses. You've seen these waterfall plots before um, throughout the day. Um, and the numbers here that I'm highlighting are the, are the tumor shrinkage rates for patients who um, have previously tried crizotinib uh, and it's failed. And you can see that they're actually relatively similar. And I would say that so far it's not clear yet that one of these um, is superior to the other. And so I think um, at this point, uh, this is not necessarily a good differentiating factor. Again, we're only starting to have data emerge on how long they work, progression-free survival. We have those numbers for seritinib, um, hopefully soon with electinib um, and Ariad, uh, Ariad's drug. Um, so th there's this kind of uh, old joke that has many, many iterations, um, and it's been at least immortalized in one of these uh, old cartoons, but a gentleman's kind of scrounging around on the um, uh, underneath a lamppost, uh, clearly looking for something, a policeman walks up uh, um, and asks, what are you doing? I, I dropped my quarter, I'm, I'm looking for it. And the policeman asks, did you drop it here? No, I dropped it two blocks down the street. Why in the heck are you looking for it here? He says, oh, the light's better here under the lamppost. Um, and so mutations are important, and I don't wanna kind of belittle them, um, but there's probably more to it, and I'm gonna to come to that in a second. So I feel that there's been a lot of emphasis on that, and for very good reason. It's an important mechanism of drug resistance. We've known since 2001, um, when patients with CML and BCR ABLE were treated with a drug called imatinib, one of the first targeted therapies, that a common mechanism of resistance is this easy genetic change that can occur um, and cause drug resistance. They're also incredibly easy to detect um, with a very small amount of material taken from a rebiopsy and relatively easy to drug. So designing a new drug um, is one way to overcome these by kind of making a new key for these. Um, whereas it's harder perhaps to think about combination therapies and, and other uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, so it is important, but it's not the only mechanism. And it's one that I think, you know, especially as uh, we move beyond thinking about moving beyond the next generation inhibitors that we have to consider. And so one other uh, uh, clear mechanism that's emerged um, is bypass signaling. So if we kind of uh, use our same analogy about the lock. So one way to protect your goods in your house is to uh, change the lock if someone steals your key or if someone finds your key. 
Um, however, and perhaps not nearly as convenient, maybe for the cancer cell or for an individual who's actually doing this, you could actually just move your stuff down the street to a very similar house um, that was, um, looks very similar, it's not exactly the same, but can do the same function keep the rain out, protect your goods, and that's actually true. So the cancer cells actually have a lot of different molecules that might be able to step in um, for ALK and do the same function, and the cancer cell's not gonna care whether or not you're giving it um, an ALK inhibitor or not, because it'll switch its activity to one of these others. And there's examples now, um, clear examples for both IGF-1R and EGFR as mechanisms of bypass signaling, so they move to another receptor um, and this, uh, the IGF-1R is very nicely, uh, work nicely published this week by uh, Christine Lovely at Vanderbilt. Um, and there's been many groups that have shown EGFR as a, as a bypass signaling uh, pathway. Okay, so which drugs to use uh, when? And I think this is a, a critical uh, a point to consider. One is, um, given that seritinib is thought to be a more potent drug that overcomes many of the resistance mutations that occur in ALK, um, should we just skip forward and use that one first? Um, and I would argue not necessarily. Now, we don't have a direct comparison of these drugs, and I know that there are, are plans uh, in the works uh, at the National Cancer Institute to consider a trial that might compare many of these drugs. Um, but if you look at some of these numbers, and again, you, there are many different progression-free survival numbers to look at for crizotinib. I've actually intentionally chosen one of the shortest to kind of make the point here still that seritinib in patients who've never received crizotinib actually isn't that much uh, better in terms of longevity on drug before it stops working. So here in patients who'd never received crizotinib, they lasted on average about nine and a half months. And crizotinib, again, you can argue seven, eight, 10 months depending on the trial, but not clearly significantly better. Again, not compared in the same trial, so you have to take this with a grain of salt. So rather than kind of sprinting ahead like Usain Bolt here um, and, and just skipping over to this new drug, we might think of the marathon analogy, which I think Leisha used this morning. We, we, we don't confer before this. I think we just all think alike. Um, this is the, actually the Boston Marathon here. So thinking about kind of a longer term plan to try and string as many of these therapies together as possible. And again, if we use the numbers that we have, this isn't in one trial, so it's, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, crizotinib about eight months and seritinib for patients who pre Previously failed crizotinib, the, um, the progression free survival is about seven months. And so, on average, um, this 14 to 15 months should be longer than this. Now, again, you have to be careful comparing these numbers, but it looks like, at least for this particular drug, um, this may be a better way to go. Um, and perhaps this, I, I'll stop with the running al analogies here, I promise. But uh, to think about this more perhaps as a relay race, um, handing off one drug to the other, because we know that you know, from, from the data that we have that this seems to be a pretty good um, situation. Now, the problem is just because for this particular drug, this seems like the way to use these, we shouldn't necessarily assume that the next ones um, will be similar. And so, there will hopefully be this trial, and as I said, the other ones uh, planned at the National Cancer Institute to compare these. So this is a direct um, comparison of the Chugai Roche compound or electinib um, compared to crizotinib. I would actually argue that the trial in reality should look something like this, um, electinib versus crizotinib followed by a next generation inhibitor, because really now I would say that crizotinib followed by seritinib is the standard of care. And so really um, we want to know if this up front is going to beat a combination uh, strategy, because again, we're in this for the long race um, to try and string as many therapies to control the disease for as long as possible. Um, sorry for the geekiness here, but, um, uh, and I'll blame my, my radiation colleagues who like these names. They used to call it SBRT, and they, they recently, at least the ones at our institution, started calling it SABER, Stereotactic Ablative Radiotherapy. It's one type of local ablative therapy. And the idea here, this is, um, um, an idea that came out of um, observations that patients were often having just progression in one or a few areas. This idea of oligo progression that you heard about this morning, I won't belabor this because you heard a lot about it, but on average, if we treat 
one or a few sites of progression, we can on average extend the time on drug. Again, this idea of getting as many uh, possible benefits out of our drugs as possible. And on average, we are able to extend time on drug by about six months. It turned out when we looked in the brain, it was longer than in other organs. Um, and that's probably uh, because the brain is a sanctuary site. I have a slide on that in a minute that we'll come back to. But this, on average, led to about a seven-month increase uh, uh, time on drug whereas progression in the liver, lung, or lymph nodes was shorter. Now, in this um, particular case, we allowed up to four uh, metastases, and that may be too many. And so these are kind of the criteria that we used and I think are welcome to be modified as we learn more. Um, you have to have kind of a significant genetic driver, ALK or EGFR, a relevant oral drug, such as crizotinib or seritinib in this case, that's generally well tolerated. And then progression just in the CNS, um, uh, um, or in less than or equal to four sites outside of the brain. A follow-up uh, publication by my colleagues, uh, Greg Gann and others, um, seemed to suggest that the fewer the number of sites that were getting worse, um, the, probably the more beneficial this was. So if you only had one or two sites, the average time was more like seven months compared to only two if you had four three or four sites. And so um, you know, I think all of us agree that CNS progression probably warrants local treatment. I think this is a little bit more controversial, but I think if it's only a few sites, it makes sense. Um, Again, you've heard about the blood-brain barrier. There's this thing that is probably evolved to keep toxins and other things that we ingest out of our brain. Um, but unfortunately, it keeps our drugs um, from reaching the brain metastases uh, as well. Fortunately now, um, there is good emerging data um, from um, uh, Chugai Roche's compound electinib um, that um, we are seeing good responses. In fact, all of the drugs have shown anecdotal responses. This is one of the larger series where we actually have a number of patients. We know, you know there were 21 patients treated. Half of them had a response. Not all of them shown on this plot. But you can see that also not only did they respond in the brain, and I think equally as important or perhaps more important, is that a lot of these responses appear to be long-lived. So Several of these are uh, 200 plus uh, uh, days um, and, and, and going uh, with these um, uh, plus signs here. Um, and so this uh, hopefully um, will really uh, alter therapy. And again, you know, something like this, if this is uh, far superior, preventing or treating brain metastases may make this drug um, a, a very useful choice. Um, again, I think you've heard a little bit about this today, so prioritizing existing drugs um, um, or, or thinking of using new, uh, in new ways drugs that we've, we've been using for a while. So Pemetrexid or Olympta has been FDA approved for a number of years for lung adenocarcinoma or, or non-squamous lung cell cancer. We noticed early on that patients who were ALK positive seemed to do particularly well. When we went back and studied this in a retrospective fashion, um, we saw that ALK-positive patients on average did better than EGFR or KRAS with this combination or, or patients who had no mutation at all. Um, and, and that has been backed up by uh, work in my laboratory suggesting that you know, cell lines that harbor these abnormalities are far more sensitive as well. We don't really understand the connection. Um, Nate, Dr. Pennell mentioned TS as one possibility. Um, I think there are others as well. But there does seem to be this uh, relationship, and I think that it's been it's uh, been somewhat supported by some of the recent trials. Um, again, not to belabor this, because there, there, there are comparisons between new trials and old trials, but in, in both the uh, crizotinib uh, registration trials, 1007 and 1014, uh, one four, the ALK positive patients treated with a Pemetrexid regimen did far better in terms of response rates and progression-free survival, especially response rates, compared to their uh, historical controls, lung adenocarcinoma patients treated with similar regimens in older trials. I don't think that this is necessarily that ALK positive patients are more sensitive to other, um, uh, to chemotherapies in general. Here you can see um, this is actually part of the same trial. The ALK positive patients did no better than docetaxel, uh, using treatment with docetaxel than historical controls. So I don't think it's a general phenomenon of being more chemosensitive. And there may be something real to this um, relationship. We actually have planned to utilize this. Um, this is a, a, um, a trial that will hopefully be coming to a site near everyone here. This is going to be a SWOG cooperative group trial, but it's been supported by all of the cooperative groups. So it should be across the country and through Canada. 
patients who are crizotinib resistant will be randomized to either pamitraxed or continuation of crizotinib with pamitraxed. And we hope this will answer three questions. Um, one, does it make sense to continue the crizotinib in the setting of chemotherapy when there's progression? Number two, it'll help us learn more about um, additional mechanisms of drug resistance. Um, so a lot of the, the majority of the patients on this trial uh, will have a biopsy. Um, and whether that relates to pemetrexed sensitivity. And third, something I didn't have time to tell you about today, is whether rechallenge with crizotinib after an intervening chemotherapy makes sense. Now, we know that this can happen from anecdotal patients. Um, we've published one, and there's been others as well, but we don't know how frequently this happens. Um, we don't know if this is 10% or 20% or 50% of patients who go from crizotinib to a chemotherapy and then go back on crizotinib right, might respond. But this portion of the trial will actually help um, answer this question. Okay, to kind of start wrapping up here, this is my algorithm and it's a little bit um, uh, complex, but perhaps not so when you kind of work through it. So first of all, all patients should really get tested for uh, ALK and ROS. Um, in fact, a lot of what I've told you today is, is I think, similar for ROS1. There are a lot of similarities uh, between the two, um, especially if you have lung adenocarcinoma, um, but other histologies have these as well. Um, crizotinib is clearly the standard of care. Um, if there's oligoprogression, consider local ablative therapy. If not, we have to ask ourselves a bunch of questions. Is there a study available? Well, if not, Ceritinib is now FDA approved, so that can be prescribed anywhere. If there is a study available, you could consider the SWOG 1300 study. One advantage of this is that it should preserve your eligibility for other next generation ALK inhibitors because it doesn't use any new uh, next generation ALK inhibitors um, or one of the uh, next generation ALK inhibitors. Again, if there's oligoprogression on one of the targeted agents, um, consider this arm again, going back to local ablative uh, therapy. Um, if not, again, asking whether there's a study available um, and some of the studies to consider HSP90, immunotherapy, or um, uh, standard chemotherapy. So to summarize, crizotinib is clearly the standard of care for ALK-positive patients at diagnosis. Local ablative therapy is a, is a very reasonable option that can be done almost anywhere uh, for patients with oligoprogression. We know that drug resistance is clearly overcome by second-generation ALK inhibitors, and that's very promising. We have very promising results in terms of treating brain metastases from electinib and others as well. Um, and again, this last point, that chemotherapy is still a very good option um, for patients uh, who are ALK positive. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my team at Colorado, my lab, various funding sources, um, uh, and, and most of all, patients who've gone on clinical trials, have donated biopsies, um, uh, because that's how we've really moved this field forward and gained a better understanding of, of how uh, resistance works. <laughs>